Okay. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I would like to welcome you most warmly to the Heinrich Böll Foundation, to the conference Fix Europe, Strategies for Social and Political Renewal in Europe. My name is Christian Schwebel. I am project mentor here at the Bell Foundation in the European Union Department. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here. <clears throat> I'm very happy about the impressive turnout on a Saturday, uh, which I guess is not only a result of the interesting and international agenda that our cooperation partner, European Alternatives, and us have put together, but also has to do with the political times we are in and that this conference is dealing with very pertinent and recent issues. <clears throat> we live in a time where we can see that the liberal democracy model and civil rights are under pressure, and not only in autocratic states, but also in the Western world. Not only the population in China is under broad surveillance, but also the populations in the United States and in European countries. <clears throat> and within Europe, not only in the newer European Union member states like Hungary, for example, um, there have been attacks on the independence of courts of justice or the freedom of press in recent years, but also in the so-called old Europe, like for instance France or Italy. At the same time, the EU's values are under massive pressure from outside. China or Russia follow anything but a liberal democracy model and are very successful with it to a certain extent. And this also puts the European Union and its values to a test. The Heinrich Böll Foundation believes that to fight these alarming anti-liberal devel developments, a strong and critical civil society is of great importance. The foundation with its international offices in 30 countries and its network of international partners tries to support critical civil society movements and attempts to achieve greater participation and democratization all over the world. We are very glad that we can call the transnational NGO European Alternatives a part of this network. It was almost exactly one year ago that we started working together on topics of European civil society, especially focusing on young people. And since then, there has been a series of youth congresses with young political activists from many European countries that were supported or organized by the Heinrich Böll Foundation and its offices, the most recent being the Fix Europe Campus by European Alternatives, which took place in Brandenburg just this week. <clears throat> so I would like to welcome the 60 participants of this workshop camp who are also present at the conference today. And thank you very much indeed for the exciting and encouraging discussions we had in the last three and a half days. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to most warmly thank all our colleagues who have prepared and organized this conference. First of all, thank you again to our partner, European Alternatives, for giving us the opportunity to be a part of this conference and the workshop camp we had earlier this week. And a big thank you especially to Daphne Bullesbach and her team here in Berlin. I once more very much enjoyed the fruitful collaboration we had on this project. <clears throat> I also would like to thank our colleagues from our conference department for the work behind the scenes and without whom this conference would not work so smoothly. Last but not least, I would like to thank the distinguished international speakers who we gathered here today for following our invitation to share their views on the future of Europe with us. And thank you to the audience once again for, for your interest and for coming here today. I wish us all an interesting, inspiring and motivating conference. Thank you very much. Daphne, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to address you today as one of the directors of European Alternatives, who organized this conference in cooperation with the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. So thank you very much also from us, Christian and Christine. Um, and obviously the Heinrich Böll Foundation for hosting this conference with us today. I speak for European Alternatives today, which is a civil so society organization that is devoted to exploring and promoting transnational politics and cultures by means of campaigns, artistic projects, and our yearly trans Europa festivals, as well as conferences as this one. We believe that today democratic participation, social equality, and cultural innovation are undermined 
by nation states in Europe and that transnational forms of collectivity must be fostered to promote these values. I don't want to waste that chance standing here today or your time, so you will forgive me for being direct. I am very concerned that Europe is missing large parts of the opportunity. I am worried that Europe will continue to stagnate, and by that I actually don't mean economically, but in terms of solidarity and as an alternative vision and political emancipatory project. I am worried that we will look at success stories and possibilities to change things for the better, but let them pass by. One of the starting points would be the outbreak of the financial crisis seven years ago. Why? Because since then, you have a, a picture of how many opportunities have been wasted. Plenty. We are losing ground constantly, every day. So why do I say that? Because I look around. I see countries, illiberal countries, TTIP, surveillance, People were still dying to reach European soil and rising inequality. Europe, Europe once led the world in human rights, living standards, ideas, but today we don't. We are not leading in climate change or alternative energies, new ways of collaborating. And then we are confronted with the statistics. For every Icelandic new initiative, uh, modern media initiative, we have a Hungary. I ask myself, why did Europe stop making progress? But then I remember that we cannot say that the whole continent has failed. No, there is a different problem. We have a problem today of two Europes. A forward-thinking, critical Europe and a backward-thinking Europe. Of social cross-continent mindsets and anti-social, nationalistic mindsets. These are two Europes that rarely talk to each other. Two Europes that hold back all of Europe because they are not in sync. There is a Europe that is full of initiative and new ideas. We see demonstrations of thousands of people in Spain. We see resistance to trika politics or neoliberal policies. We have a young generation that fights for refugee rights, for net neutrality, for alternative economies, for commons, and against the erosion of civil rights. They, die, they dare to try something new. This Europe is open and critical. This Europe hates mental barriers and looks for new opportunities. But there is a second Europe. It is a Europe that is afraid of its future, they worry about where the new middle class jobs will actually come from. They don't want to jump off what they see as a European cliff. They like the comforting ideas of putting up walls and to many people it makes sense to restrict other people and to protect against their way of living. Political leaders have a choice about how to lead people to the more realistic and hopeful sides of those debates. They have a choice about how to approach their responsibility to lead. Is Europe's leadership class willing to be excited about forward thinking? Or is Europe going to be exhausted by using up its energy, safeguarding vested interests and holding up ancient barriers? I don't know how Europe will answer. I believe change is possible, but in my mind, there are too many leaders still refusing to take up their responsibility. But I wouldn't be standing here if I would believe you can shape this world only from the top down. The crisis has shown the limits of state power and national politicians, and it reaffirms the need to collaborate, the search for alternative economic models. We have many solutions on the table. We need to get down to making them happen. Europe is not going to prosper if our conversations are about the next year instead of the next generation. If our conversations are ignoring fundamental power structures and we are repeating the same mistakes again, we will fail. If our conversations ignore the grassroots efforts of civil society in favor of old parties and stakeholders, we will fail. If our conversations, uh, those grassroots efforts are real. Just look at net, net neutrality, data retention, the water ECI, or the Occupy movement. There are ways to engage people. We as European Alternatives have mobilized over 200,000 people across Europe to stand up for media freedom and press, press uh, media pluralism and press freedom. We have to collaborate around new tools that enable individual citizens to pressure politicians and decision makers. Or to rephrase it in the words of our keynote speaker Saskia Sassen, we need to return to making our citizenship in instead of just being consumers. This is why we organized the campus Fix Europe and why we're here today to discuss these questions. The question of our agency for change in a neoliberal system that seduces too many of us to conformity, economizes almost all our aspects of lives, that fails our fundamental freedoms and creates staggering levels of inequality. 
But before I now hand over to Saskia Sassen, I want to end by saying that in spite of these difficult questions that I constantly pose myself as an activist, I, I believe we can change even the fundamental wrongs in our society. We have in fact just come back, and most participants are in this room here today, from a three-day campus where we spend intense days to discuss around these issues that concern us, mostly young people, in Europe today, and how we believe we can tackle them creatively and effectively. This campus has given me enormous strength, inspiration and hope. This is the Europe that isn't waiting for leaders to solve the burning problems. This Europe is just out there fixing the problems themselves with very little help from Europe's leadership class. That is one of the two Europes, optimistic and active and building a better Europe. And I think we need more of that. We need to bring that critical mindset across Europe. It is a fundamental for defending our democratic system and to stand up against the great risk that Europe lets itself be sucked again into a negative counter attitude and passivity. Overcoming these divisions cannot be left to attacking the malfunctioning institution. It lies in our hands. And we can start with everyone here in the room. We agree on more than we disagree on. We are part of something bigger than our own opinions and our own country. We are part of one Europe and it is time to drag the other Europe along to our side and let's build the alternatives together. Europe is here a metaphor for the whole world or just a blue dot and you are leading. Let me now give the floor to Saskia who I think I don't need to introduce to this audience. We're extremely honored to have you. You have just come from New York where we are still teaching yesterday and uh, you are one of the most critical voices by whom a lot of activists around the globe feel very inspired by. So thank you very much for being with us today. Can somebody change my slides? Change the slides? Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I really admire and respect what Daphne is trying to do. If we have a battalion of Daphne's, we would really make a difference. <laughs> so keep it up. Um, well, I, I, um, I want to cover a lot of ground in, uh, in, uh, in the little time that I have. And my attempt really is to situate the issue. The issue being one way of... What do you mean? I know, but I need to see my slides because that is lateral and that is lateral. And, you know, I just, it's not like I remember my sequence of slides. I don't, I just, I, because I keep inserting new thingies. But I'm really sorry. I will every now and then say hello <laughs> to this side and then, you know, to the other one. Um, so I like to, to situate, you know, the question of who are we, the citizens, and by the way, I want to add immediately, all immigrants except a count, supposedly 10 million, uh, are citizens. They're just citizens of another country. But the way our law treats them, of course, you would think that they would be illegal people. And there is no such thing as an illegal human me uh, being. Kind mensch ist illegal. I think that came out of Germany, know that phrase. I think I like that a lot. Um, so I want to situate it in a broader, in a broader context. I, I do think that part of the, the struggle is to understand who is gaining rights. There are a lot of actors who are gaining rights, corporations, and if we sign the new trade treaties, you know, the TTIP and the TTP, they make them sort of incomprehensible, corporations are gaining even more rights. They're gaining the option of their own private justice if a state disagrees, way beyond WTO. So when you look at the last 30 years of I have done and you ask yourself, who's gaining rights? Well, there are some who are, and it's mostly not citizens. We have gained some rights, like on, on the question of gays, etc., and we have lost rights. And, um, and quite a few of the rights we have gained have come, and this repeats a historical pattern, have come from outsiders, whether they are gays, whether they are immigrants, outsiders have fought for an expansion of the rights, which has then had a benefit, direct or indirect, on all citizens. In Europe, 
and some of you probably know that history much better than I do, a lot of the expansion of rights came from outsiders. And at some point, I always like to say, we need to ask ourselves, when is the immigrant us? Germans, Irish in the United States, my God, we just, they are us. Well, at one point, the same language was used about them as was then used about Latinos and other. So when you look at human, human sort of, uh, at, at groups, you know, the group factor, the, the organization, social organizational factor, it's very interesting to see who has fought for an expansion of existing rights of people. Now, today there are, it really in, in a country like the United States, I'm not sure about Germany, if we have gained rights, it's the rights for 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 gays and you know other other such uh, and and uh, and they were sort of outsiders no matter how long they may have been lived in they may have been living in the United States so I just want to put that that sort of in in the framing now um, for me when I, I I wish I had a mic can I have a does this work? Yes, it works. So, so for me, the question of citizenship, you can see me now. Hi. <laughs> the, the question of citizenship, uh, if I'm trying to understand it, I cannot simply say citizenship is citizenship. I have to remove myself enough that I have to rediscover conceptually and analytically what is citizenship. And so I like to think of it as an incompletely theorized contract with a very powerful actor capable of giving or taking, and that's the state. And so for me, a second feature about this institution that explains its longevity and that we can actually work with it, it's unstable, and that's both good and bad, of course, right? But it is, um, it is an incompletely theorized, I want to emphasize that, it is never quite done. And that is partly because it has the capacity, and I really think it is a capacity, to capture transformations that are happening in a time, in a period, et cetera, et cetera. Extremely important. I make the same argument about cities. Cities are complex, but incomplete spaces. And in that mixture of complexity and incompleteness, they can outlive far more powerful, but formal and closed systems Republic, states, kingdoms, multinational corporations, financial firms, you name, it, you, you name it. Many of them no longer exist. And the cities where they operated still exist. So when we think about the question of membership in that sort of broader historical uh, frame, you know, I, I think that there are possibilities and this effort to rethink what does it mean today for citizens in Europe to... Uh, to launch certain attempts to, to, to change, to gain rights, to include more and more groups into those rights. Um, and and um, so let me move to this next. So one, one way of framing it then is we need to ask who's gaining rights? Who has the power to set government agendas and priorities? Why do we, the citizens, not have more power to do that? And here I love to mention uh, the fact that this is just a footnote to illustrate how little power we have. That, for instance, the Fed, I'm sure in Germany you have equivalent, albeit less dramatic cases. For instance, the government of the United States, without asking us who give it our money, its money comes from the citizens, extended 17 trillion dollars. Trillions is a lot of zeros. I know you use other designations in Europe, but anyhow, uh, without telling us, through the legislature went 320 billion, much less, fewer zeros there, less money. That was debated. In the meantime, secret circuit our money went to 21,000 claimants, which included German banks, Swiss banks, French banks, Italian banks, etc. the global banking system. Now, that to me is a very dramatic example, I mention it, to the extent to which we, 
who supposedly are the reason for that government to exist are not asked. I think we should have on all our agendas. We need to develop channels to access government's agendas. I'm sure that some people, at least in Germany, feel that every now and then they wish the government agenda were a little different. Um, now, I, the last sentence there, I think of ourselves as makers. And I want to do an analysis that is centered in the making of conditions. Emphasizing making is a partial, it means a partial analysis because you have inherited genealogies of meaning, inherited institutions. They may have been made, but so far in the past that we don't experience that. But I want to take this partial way of looking at our present and our recent past to sort of make, uh, make my points, if you want. But again, I repeat, I know very well that emphasizing making does mean uh, leaving out longer time frames and more sort of complex, if we might say, externalities that also are in play. Um, now, to do that, I have sort of developed, um, and I, I do think that the question of method matters, and it also matters politically, I would say. So I, I allow myself here two minutes on, uh, on before method. To do what I do, what I just described, I need to create a space for myself where I can really be free from the constraints of established methods. I need to eventually, as a social scientist, I need to return to the zone of method. But before I go there, I need to explore the terrain that I want to subject to analyses and to investigation, to what I think matters, regardless of what established paradigms tell us to do. So I want to emphasize that. Now, eventually, I often do return to a more you know, domesticated zone. Uh, and so the, the, the way I think of these are analytic tactics, the freedom to position myself vis-a-vis -vis the object of study the way I want, the way I need, whether that is in the rules of the game or not. And so here are a few of these analytic tactics. The first one is I really think that we need to destabilize what are still fairly stable meanings. What is the meaning today of citizenship? What does it mean to be an immigrant? Remember the word immigrant comes with a very positive charge. There's something good, there's something of courage, there's something of contributing, etc. Immigrant is now a very unstable term, I would say. What does the state mean? What does the economy mean? What do the middle classes mean? They are all realities that continue to exist, but they're not as stable, I would argue, just to look at our, at our very short history, uh, as they were in the, in the post-war decades in the West. You know, when you have the growth of a middle class, you have a state that gives public transport, expands public schools, expands public hospitals, etc. There was always inequality and racism, but still it was a state that was expanding the zone of prosperity for modest sectors of the population, right? Today, the state is not doing that. So the question is then, you know, it's not that the state has totally changed, no, but something is not there anymore and it has been replaced by something else. So in that sense, these very powerful terms that at the limit function as invitations not to think, you know, when you say the state, I mean, you say, oh, yeah, I know what that is. You don't think, you don't want to. So I sort of want to, to shuttle it around a bit. Now, secondly, powerful explanations. Powerful explanations cannot just be thrown out of the window. But what we can do is ask ourselves, what don't I see when I invoke a powerful explanation? When I say the state, and I simply keep on talking, what don't I see? Because as I said, the state just evokes all kinds of things. It is a very powerful category. Same thing with all kinds of other terms. So sort of this need to, to, to ask what don't I see. And I will give you several examples here of that. And then the third, I'm, I've really gotten very interested with the question of territory. And I think of territory as a, as a complex category. It is not space, it's not terrain, it's not ground, it's not land, it's something else. It's partly 
constructed. And so it has embedded, one way of putting that, it has embedded logics of claim making, I mean, I'm sorry, of power, that's the state. And in our Western modernity, the state was the most developed uh, system of power, if you want. And, and with some good parts attached to it. And it has embedded logics of claim making, which are in our Western modernity, again, is citizenship. It's the most accomplished form of that, right? Um, now, complex category, yes, but if it has only one meaning, which today it has, which is national sovereign territory, as in the current interstate system, it is not working analytically. And I think it is a category that we need to recover. We need to make it work analytically. And so I think of, for instance, the global city as the making of a certain kind of territory by powerful corporate actors, but also by powerless people, because they are needed in that new system. It's a territory that is neither fully national nor fully global. And then the question is, what are other territories? If I can deploy that category territory, what could I see that I don't see now? I think the Occupy movements, one of their, one of their, their real contributions is that they made territory. And when you think of alternative sort of local economies, they have a way of making territory. So I'm very interested in making that category work. And again, I will return to it um, in, in this talk. And then finally, the making of it all. We are makers, for good or for bad. And uh, I just want to emphasize that I use this term making also in the sense of making justice, making inequality, making et cetera, et cetera. It's not just making a table. And so I would argue, we made this. These are 52 million. This is just the formal count of the displaced people. Displaced, by the way, most of those people are never going back to their home. And the population keeps growing. If we add the Syria war now, etc., it keeps growing more still. Um, home for these people is now a plantation for you know, crops for biofuels, probably a war zone, a new private city. So what are we seeing when we call them the displaced? Displaced suggests displaced, but there is a place, there is no place. And I think more and more people, including deep inside our very prosperous societies, and I will show you some figures, are, we still have names for them, but we need to ask, who are they? And that also connects, of course, to who are we, because some of the we's, you know, some of us might have been in some of those camps. Now, this we also made. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. In only 20 years, we managed to reduce one of the biggest bodies of water, the darkest water, into a sliver. Billions of cubic meters of water gone. And I just use this because this is a famous case, the RLC. We have all read novels where it is a actor and it is you know but i can you know very well that we can we have many examples of this so when i say making i mean i mean it in some very um vast sense if you want and here of course is another one right uh, and i think actually that the environmental question is becoming a critical variable and it could be a critical vector in generating at least new partial economies um, now, let me, let me start giving you a bit of an analysis of where I think we stand right now. What are the forces shaping our current condition? Where do we fit in? How can we address them? How can we intervene? Because I do think that the project that Daphne describes, you know, how can we, the citizens, be more active in the making of policies in the making of our societies, the social question, etc., does mean that you need to understand, I'm sure that many of you do, what is actually going on. So one frame and question that I like is what is the steam engine of our epoch? The steam engine in that historic sense, something that is present directly and indirectly and has an extraordinary shaping influence, whether it is direct or indirect. It's somehow everywhere. 
that's an exaggeration, but it just cuts across. And so the typical answer when I get a chance to hear what people think is the steam engine of our epoch is, and one would almost say, of course, information technologies. I think they are like a steam engine too. But I say no. Because in a way, uh, I think there is a sharper force that is more difficult to contest. The information technologies we can somehow get handle on big parts of it. There are other things that are, so I think, more difficult. And so I argue that it is finance. And by finance, I mean a capability. And the curve that you see here is what I'm really interested in. You don't need to look at the details. Short period of time, 201, it was under a trillion. Six years later, highest point, 207, it is 62 trillion. That is a capability. Moreover, only one little part of that really exists as money. The, the estimate is that actual money, we measure it in money, but most of that is not money that exists. The, the estimate of money as counted by the central banks of the world is about 250. Uh, 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 what, no, I, I have to, I have to re, re, retake that figure. I've, I'll come back to you on that one. But so this is 62 trillion. These 62 trillion at that point uh, where only 10% of the total value of global finance, which was 630 trillion. Today it's a quadrillion. Now, a quadrillion is even more zeros than trillion. Now, this, this 62 trillion, the, uh, this, the 630 trillion is far more than the two, that was the figure I was after, than the 250 trillion that is estimated to exist as currencies of all the governments in the world. That is always an unstable measure, of course. You understand what I'm saying, right? So I say capability because it can produce a value that is way beyond measured in money, that is way beyond the actual supply of money. And that gives you a sense of the power of this sector. Now, what I, what I, what I like to sort of say in order to make a distinction is that, that that traditional banking is actually a function that we all need. A little bank in your town, you know, will tend to also recirculate the whatever the the interest, the capacity to pay interest that the local people have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think the banking function is an important function. Finance is not banking. We tend to think it's the same thing. It really isn't. So I I sort of make this comparison. I say banking. The traditional bank sells money it has. Finance sells something it does not have. And in that selling what it does not have lies its creativity and its danger. It has to produce extraordinarily complex instruments to invade other sectors. It must invade other sectors because otherwise there is no grist for its mill. I don't know if this is language that is understood in, for Germans. You know, grist is like... If you have a mill, you want something for it. Yeah? So grist for your mill. I love that English expression. Now, that it, it does mean that it has a capacity to design instruments that allow it to invade just about anything. And now I want to give you some examples. Now we begin to go to ground level here of what's happening. And, and here, just very quickly, I don't want to dwell too much on this. I just want to give you a sense of what's going on. And the, the juxtaposition here is global finance in search of actual material assets discovers modest little houses. The challenge is how do you delink the asset from the complex instrument that you're going to be selling to the high-level investors? You mix it up with high-grade debt, etc. The details don't really matter. The point is that they use these... These, uh, these modest uh, home buyers to create an instrument where the challenge, I repeat, was de-link the instrument from the actual housing. It was a deadly, venomous formula for the modest income people who tried to buy those houses. They mostly lost. So here are the figures very quickly. The, the total is now estimated at 13 million out of their homes. 13 million households can be 30 million people. Now, that's quite a bit. Second point here, many people tend to think this can only happen in the United States. The United States is a bit of a wild west, no doubt. But actually, I want to show you some figures for Europe. 
And here we are. Among the high is Germany. Germany who can't get anything wrong, supposedly, right? So here you have every year, these I just have three years here. Huh? So every year, this is not cumulative. This is sort of 91 in this year, 88 in this year, etc. Now it's clearly a small number. Remember, these are households, so we're talking more people than that. And, um, and it's invisible. It's also invisible in the United States, where we're talking millions. These are people who lose their home. Now, that doesn't mean that they become homeless. Actually, those who become homeless might be more visible than that in between who keeps losing, keeps losing, but hides it behind a little facade where who knows what the histories are that are developing there, right? And this is an issue, this question of very material conditions that are invisible. I'm very interested in my little expulsions book. I deal a lot with what is visible and what is not visible. And in that sense, argue that we need to go back to ground level. We need to de-theorize, construct new, new theorizations. We need theory to see. In Greek, theoria is seeing. I love that. Most academics have forgotten that meaning. For most academics, constructing models of some sort. Theoria is seeing. Now, it's seeing not with this eye, but with that other eye, right? So I think that to see some of the conditions that I've been working on on these last four years for expulsions actually means to develop new bridges into that. So that actually stands out. That becomes part of the history rather than disappearing in the space of the expelled. I make that same argument for dead land and dead water. Dead land and dead water should be on all our maps. It should start in kindergarten. That, that big patch of dead land, little boy, we did that. We killed that. That's what these little kids should be learning. In fact, we disappear it under some sort of terra neutra eh, that we depict. Now, as you can see also, and I sort of love this, the good uh, European countries, Denmark, Netherlands, Netherlands much less good than Denmark, I would say. I'm Dutch, so I feel free to say that. Um, they also have very little numbers, but it is like a little thing is there. This instrument is now traveling to India and China. Devastating. It could have devastating effects. It's the most brilliantly designed instrument that you can get the asset, do away with the people who signed the contract, those agents had to get 500 contracts signed every week to make it work. 15 million such contracts were signed. And now we know that 13 million meant out. And according to Bernanke, when he left the, the head of the Fed, he said it's going to go up to 14 million. So you see what we're talking about. That is a capability. And I know I'm not speaking of capability in the Amartya Sen. For Amartya, a capability is a positive. I argue we can't assume that what might be positive time one is going to be positive time two. Everything tends to be changing meaning. So I say it's a, a capability is a variable. It could be good, it could be bad. It could start good and end bad. It could start bad and end good, you know, something like that. Am I speaking too fast in English? Are you all with me? You can write, because I tend to... I hope the interpreters are not suffering too much. Now, here is a little trick that we're all subject to. If you ask yourself, what is the bridge of that very powerful capability into each one of us? Our home, our, you know, whatever, it is debt. And so I want to do just a bit on debt. So I want to start, you don't need to read all of these numbers, but let's start with this incredible title, Ratio of Household Credit to Personal Disposable Income. Credit sounds really good. It's debt, okay? It's a bridge. But look at that language. Now, this is IMF staff papers. This, this is stuff that often is not published, but it's, it's in the public domain. Now, look at this period, 2000 to 2005. Same period as what I described about that mortgage, right? Look at Hungary, just to take an extreme example. 11.2%, very reasonable. At that time, the United States was already over 100, okay? And, uh, and Spain, by the way, is at 65, still very reasonable. 
Now, look, Hungary, five years later, almost 40%. I can't quite make it work. You see it die, right? For almost 40%. Uh, Czech Republic, 8 to 27. Very Germany at the same time is 70, 70, 70, 70. It's just incredible stable. Spain, in the meantime, went from 65 to 112. And when you say debt, it's not necessarily all household debt. Here we're talking about household debt. But you are talking about a condition that is not immediately evident when you say debt, which is that some system has a grip on something that you can give. And if you give it to a big bank, <laughs> you say, bye-bye, bye-bye what I had. Now, so I ask myself also, who, who owns these debts? You understand what I'm asking, right? So in the case of Hungary, I went back to the IMF's uh, staff papers, 40% is owned of that household debt. And most Hungarian households are modest, by the way. Um, is owned by foreign banks. They're mostly French, German, and Swiss. That is not good. You understand what I'm saying, right? Whatever you, the interest payments that you are paying, who knows where they go? If it's your local little bank, your local, li your local little credit union, it recirculates in the community. It becomes partly a collective good, right? You understand? If it's taken out, same thing with franchises. It may be very nice to have a Starbucks. I don't go there, but anyhow, that's not that's just a question of I don't know what taste or politics maybe too. But the Starbucks is a franchise, and so much of that cap consumption capacity again it holds for any franchise. It leaves if a mom and pop, as we used to call them, does it, or a group of young students who like doing it, it can stay in the community. So the localizing, the localizing, the localizing is, for me, one of the important issues. It builds community. It builds solidarities. Solidarities that can be very instrumental. You need each other. And so all that franchising that we're doing, it's, to me, extremely problematic part of this story. Um, now, I want to show you a few curves so that you get a sense. And to me, these are beautiful. I love these lines. Instead of... A, you know, a jungle of numbers. One line that tells a tale. So here we have a very interesting line, actually, if you really look at it. This is corporate profits after tax in the United States from 1940 to 2010. Now, the fact that this is a flat line is just because it's being counted in billions, okay? So it's not like nothing was happening here, but it's sort of happening beneath the billion. Then it starts to really go up. Look at this. It goes up, up, it has a dip during the crisis that lasts about half an hour. It's actually two years. And then it goes up even more. In the meantime, you have all kinds of households, all kinds of workers that have experienced the dip and have stayed there. They have not gone and then suddenly made more. This is a systemic dynamic. And it explains partly why there is more and more accumulation at the top even if vast sectors of the population are losing, either, d you know, uh, including indirectly, like your increase of salary is not as high as it used to be. Now, here's a line. They don't even have a dip. Nothing, as if nothing. And it keeps on... You know, <laughs> these are the years of severe crises, you know, 2008, 2009. Look at that. It's as if, bye-bye, you who are all in crises. I'm flying. I'm doing fine. This is extraordinary, the story that it tells. It tells you something about a system that is not touched by the fact that you have very significant unemployment, that you have state budgets uh, you know, in the negative, more and more, more and more state debt, that, say, a country like the United States, we have 6,000 bridges guaranteed that they're going to be falling down very soon. We don't have money for that. And do you understand, you understand what I'm saying, right? I mean, to me, this is very important, not just to rant against, but to actually show they are untouched. Now, part of that is the 17 trillion. Remember that I mentioned to you? Because the 70 trillion was used to develop high profit-making instruments rather than to give little loans 
to little factories, little businesses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have an extreme distortion. And here, of course, is the growing debt of central governments. Now let me move on. These, I'm just going to pass very quickly. By now, this is familiar stuff. Uh, these are this is a hundred years. I love this graph. I think this is a beauty. Hundred years of inequality indirectly measured. The Keynesian years, it worked, it worked. You read the literature of these years, you say, we have the formula for having prosperous middle classes and prosperous working classes. We will never give it up. Well, before they knew it, 1987, up we were again. Now, I just want to, here I just want to, to say one thing, up, 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 everything. What, care, what I care for these 30 years is this bottom, almost 50%, zero increase, basically. Now, when you were living in a city in those 30 years, what you saw was going from poverty, destruction, etc., to everything being rebuilt beautifully. We also call it gentrification, you know, stuff like that. The visual order in our cities did not tell this tale, this divergence. It told the tale of more, more up, more better housing, more better this, more better. In the meantime, an enormous part of the population was experiencing zero growth. That was an invisible story. Now, part of that zero is, say, middle-class people, I'm sure you have the same thing in Germany, who are still living in the same old houses. The facades are the same. I repeat the story of before, but behind the facades, you had histories of you have histories of impoverishment, doubling up of families, etc. So again, what we don't see is, to me, very the materialities. In other words, that we don't see. Here's another thing. So we have always had increases, but look at that. The time of the crises, the concentration of wealth. Look how it goes up. Concentration. The crisis has affected certain sectors and not others. Here is more of the same, even loss as this grows, right? So I just want to move on here. This is a very different story now, just to give you as an example. I have a lot of this kind of stuff in the little book, but this is people who left from Spain. In other words, they left Europe. This Europe, who thinks itself as being the desired destination for the world and says, we can't take any more people. Well, they're also leaving. You just don't get to see it very often. The only group that didn't increase its departures was Oceania, in this case, maybe because it's a bit far away, you know what I mean? So, but these are, again, these are, these, these are real material histories, and they are not part of the dominant understandings, huh? And you can do that for several countries, actually. Now, clearly Spain was in crisis. Now, here I want to, to start moving into something that has to do with an argument that I make that a lot of the immigrants are actually expelled. They are not necessarily immigrants, we should. And I look at land grabs. The land grab story, again, I don't want to dwell too much on it, is a story that I think people are becoming aware of it, I, I think it tells multiple histories. It tells environmental histories, clearly environmental destruction, and it tells, uh, it tells us something about the ambiguity of the state as an institution. So let me just very quickly say, this is a long history of empires, etc. I don't want to dwell on that part. I just want to talk about this last period that begins with the crisis, when 220 million hectares of land were bought, by about 15 governments and over 100 firms, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and certain parts of Asia, but also parts of Latin America. And it's now also happening in Europe. So in France, for instance, there are young men and women who would like to go back to farming as their families did because that's the best job they can get. They can't buy land. There is no land. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, there were lots of abandoned farms. It's been bought up by corporates. So also in Europe, you have it. In England, foreigners are also buying up quite a bit of land. Anyhow, so this is again a story of 
dismantlement of existing structures and relationships, I would argue, with between governments and citizens or residents, because the land is private. I have a little project now that I call Who Owns the City? And I look at certain cities. And uh, growing parts of these cities are literally owned by big investors, whether national or foreign. Quite a few are foreign. So n not to hit on any particular country, but so the Chinese just bought one of the vastest stretches of land in New York City. It, I actually find that rather intriguing, I must tell you. Except when I've, I just love the idea of China owning a bit, bit of New York, just as a contestatory position. I know it's ridiculous, but anyhow, we humans. But now I don't, I'm not so happy anymore. So they are building 14 huge apartment buildings in that huge patch of land, one of the few pieces of land that was still very low density. Anyhow, this is a story that is repeating itself a lot. And so I argue, you know, how do you buy land in a city? You buy it in the form of buildings. But when that much is bought, you have to stand back and say, what am I actually seeing, right? So I wonder, I mentioned this stuff about the cities because we tend to think, oh, well, land grabs, that is another world. No, no, it's the whole sort of repositioning of territory, complex category, into land, elementary category that can deliver profits. No logics of claim making, just logics of power, if that. So anyhow, here very quickly, some of the, in oh, five minutes, no. She just put up a big sign. Um, so, so here, um, here is some of the information, you can see it, et cetera, et cetera. Important point, uh, most of it is not for food. Not that that would make it that much better, by the way, but it is for f industrial crops, for biofuels, which means two things. It means a lot of poisoning of the land and water because you can put in whatever you want and accelerated destruction. It also means that areas where you always had poor people but you didn't have hunger, like in Argentina or in Brazil, you now also have hunger because you can't eat that. I must say that, just I don't think I need to do that with this crowd here, but when you buy land like that, what happens? You are expelling floras, faunas, you know, cultures of peoples, genealogies of meaning, uh, rural manufacturing districts, you are expelling a lot. In the end, you're left with people with nothing. And where do those people go? What is the last place where you can still put down your body? Big cities. So a lot of the urbanization story, it's not, oh, people want to go to cities. It's not like in older periods, perhaps. It's a different kind of story. Um, now, so in this sense, I'm also arguing both from the, on the part of, you know, these huge acquisitions in a foreign country, sovereign country, supposedly, the meaning of the national state, but I'm also thinking in a broader sense, connecting it to all that I have said. You know, these, everything that I've told you so far suggests an instability in the position of the national state. Uh, so when the, the nationalisms are trotted out vis-a-vis -vis the question of immigration, it's really very problematic, even no, if you, even if you don't look at the substance of the content, but behind that other thing, how states are treating each other. So the question of nationhood and statehood, I think is really on our agenda to sort of, we have to reposition it. It also tells us something about the traditional borders, question of borders. Uh, you know, when you have 15 foreign governments buying huge parts of land in, in about 70 countries, you know, there's so much stuff happening, and then suddenly we trot out the border as this sacred something uh, when we talk about immigration and refugees. Now, here I had a whole set of graphs that show the, how we are destroying land and water. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, so I want to end then very quickly, returning to this question of unstable meanings, right? Um, and in, in a way, more and more expulsions from increasingly scarce, livable space. If you look at it globally, if you look at Europe, Europe is still an amazingly livable, the most livable part of the world, probably. Um, but continuing then with more unstable meanings, this question of membership, membership in a nation state, 
what are we talking about? So I would think that the work of citizenship that that this this uh, this uh, this three day event that you've had, I gather partly is about really the question of the borders is just not uh, you know it, it, we have to deal with it, but there is something else that is happening. Um, and I want to end with this image. And I don't know how many people have seen this map. It's in the public domain, by the way. I'm just curious. Can I see a raise of hands? Very few. Uh, you have seen it. Right. So this has been in the public domain for a very long time. It's 10,000 buildings that are now fully built. When, I, when it first came out, the, the big b some of these big buildings were not built. Now they're basically all, except for some new, uh, new ones in D.C. And it's full-time data gathering about all of us. You know, my email your email, etc. if you e email me. I mean, it's a, we know that. When Snowden comes into the picture and distributes this information, that is when my audiences, to whom I begin to really understand what that was. So I would tell them, this is 10,000 buildings doing this. And I could just tell that they understood it mentally, but they couldn't give it content. And again, the the materiality of these buildings. You know, again, back to what is visible and what is not visible. Now, the reason I show this, and I should just give you this one bit about DC, just to give you a sense of the material implant that this means. And you can stand in front of it, and it's invisible. You don't know what is happening there. So in, in, in Washington, 33 building complexes for top secret intelligence work are under construction or have been built since September 2. And by now, they're mostly done. Together, they occupy 17 million square feet. That's quite a bit. Uh, the equivalent of almost three pentagons. The pentagon is huge. Or, and this is the best part, 22 US, U.S. Capitol buildings. The Capitol being the house of democracy. So this stuff that surveys the, the citizens, well, whoever is in the country, is um, <clears throat> 22 times bigger than the house of democracy. That's an indication of something. Now... That then, and I end, who are we the citizens? And I have emphasized a bit the story of the citizens, including the citizens in prosperous countries, to bring to the fore those older histories that, we, that provide us with facts, that we need alliances with those who are a bit excluded or very much excluded, who live in our societies to expand the meaning of citizenship, to get the new kinds of rights that we, the comfortable citizens, don't even understand are needed by people until it hits also us, as with those foreclosures or whatever. I've so so, so the, what I want to leave you with is the instability of the category citizenship and the history that has been constructed over these last 20 years that I've shown you, which keeps strengthening certain sectors, very small portions of our larger lives, and, and, that, and their prosperity can coexist with immiseration in many other parts. And then finally, the histories. Well, I didn't really talk about this, but I've written about that, that when you look historically, when we have gotten new rights, how important those who lacked rights were in helping us, in making us see that we needed those rights. Our comfort zone is really very, very unstable. It was far more stable 20 years ago than it is today, our comfort zone as citizens. We are getting hit. A lot of what, how we are getting hit is invisible, but it's there and it will pop up before we know it. So I'm all for this project. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. So, questions? I didn't mean to sound down. I'm all for, I would love to keep on talking, so.
I would like to contest one issue that you touched about uh, financial capital not being money. Uh, not being money, real money. I think it's very real because it affects everybody. My point of view is that uh, part of, the hu of human nature, part of the human condition, is to create value. And it, to create value. It could be building a car, it could be building a home, it that. could be doing a surgery that saves lives. So, but as we move forward in human evolution, like we did in the Industrial Revolution, this value, this production of value, is now abstracted. It is abstracted in the financial sphere. And uh, it grows, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, because it's a growth that can happen without uh, necessarily straining the material resources of the planet. But it's now a growth that is being controlled by actors that are capable in the game of financial speculation. So I would actually uh, place the opponent in the, in the speculative capital. And uh, this speculative capital is now in control of the main power points in our system. And this speculative capital is gaining more and more political power. Right. Okay, then so, let me just, yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, so, so, well, you, you said. So, so I agree with that. It's speculative and it's more and more in control. I also would agree with the point that, I didn't say that here, but I say that typically when I give a talk about this, that, you know, capital finance makes capital at a rate and at a scale that traditional banking can't. When I look at all that we need to do, clean up toxic dumps, dumps you know, green our economy, that will take a lot of money, but then we need to materialize it to bring it down, because if we don't bring it down, it keeps on becoming more and more speculative and then brings the rest of us down. Right now, there are no actors, let me just finish please, there are no actors that can bring it down and it itself does not know how to govern itself. The reason those $17 trillion were claimed by 21,000 actors in the global banking system is because the rarest commodity in high finance was simple, straightforward cash, currency. Because so much of it, 80% of finance, is not. You see, so the miracle is, my God, it can make capital. In a monetized economy, bring it down, build, you know, a green transport system, social housing, clean up toxic dumps, great. The challenge is, how do you bring it down? So now the other thing I want to say is, look, most of finance, the value of finance, a quadrillion, I mean, now it just went down a bit because of a little crisis at the beginning, but... It, does, it doesn't exist as money. So I say, I didn't say that, that you know, but, but my, my, my point is um, that finance does not sell money like traditional banking does because it mostly is doing something that is not money. And if the currencies of all the central banks are 250 trillion and the total value of finance as measured by outstanding derivatives is almost a quadrillion, well, that leaves you a huge gap of something that is not money. We monetize it because it's the only way we know how to measure it. And if we could bring it down, it could function as money. As long as it stays up there, it is mostly not. Now, we could keep on doing this debate, but let's do that afterwards, okay? No, no, let's just go to a question on the question of citizen. Of course, but how do we do that? Because finance does not allow you, and finance brings itself down. That's the other thing. Nobody, it cannot govern itself. Now, I have so many stories, like the aluminum Goldman Sachs bought a whole pile of aluminum, and the way we found out was about what they were doing was the truckers. The truckers said, we keep moving all this aluminum. For a week, they keep it us moving. Well, what was Goldman Sachs doing by owning that aluminum? Delaying deliver, uh, delivery of the aluminum. That creates a crisis in the markets which raises the prices of aluminum enormously. 
And then Goldman Sachs has a whole pile of money for it. That is the way it makes money. It makes money out of you know something that that is a complete abuse. And now, of course, that's it's gone to trial to defend itself because it's considered an illegal activity. When you look at how finance has functioned, it is, has been an extremely abusive system. So I would like to, can we, can we uh, have another question maybe? There are no other questions and you, yes. Yeah. Um, it's not about citizenship, but about territory. Um, I was so interested in what you explained that um, you know, companies or other states buying territory or buying land in another state. Are there any states that are sort of worried about it? Anybody doing anything about it, thinking about it? Yeah. Okay. It's an extraordinary event. I mean, you know, many, if you have a hardcore Marxist, they would say nothing new. You understand why, right? I mean, you know, but there is a big difference. So when Britain, Britain wanted the whole of Africa, Spain wanted the whole of Latin America, so to speak, right? These current forms of using other countries' land to produce something that you want to produce, they are very specialized insertions and captures. And temporarily, they only want to be there as long as they can extract something. And then they leave because they have destroyed whatever it is that they were using and they go on to the next one. Now, the question that you ask has two components, but one of them is, is anybody doing anything about it? The, the problem, I think, and this comes back to the question of the state, I think the state as we know it, the so-called modern state, is a decaying institution. And we, the citizens, need to reoccupy it and make it work for serious agendas. So in many of these countries, the elites... They are making money of it. They don't care. The land is destroyed. The, you know, there are whole areas of the world now where Coca-Cola and Nestle and a bunch like that have exhausted underground water tables. I mean, it's a, it truly is extraordinary, the scale at which this stuff is happening. Also in the United States, there are two parts of Texas that have no more underground water taken out by Nestle. Thank you. I mean, we drink it. This sounds better to me. Glass bottle. This is good and probably local something, all those mountains that you have in Germany. But when you look at the cheap plastic balls of Nestle, it's another story, or Coca-Cola, or all that. But anyhow, so, so there are so many vested interests, and the, the temporalities for projects are short. So there is a problem. I mean, I do think one image that I have is that we are seeing these, these very tight geographies that cut across all divides, north, south, east, west. These are geographies that mix the elites of Luanda in Angola, even as Angola is poor, poor, poor. And you know, I'm just saying Luanda because people still think that Angola might be socialist. Angola is no longer, you know, that switched hands. And a very poor country. And right now, Luanda is the most expensive city because there's almost no housing, but the high-level professional classes are moving in because there are natural resources. So it is a rape of, you know, but really it's also happening in the United States on the, on the thing of water especially, not to mention fracking. So it is a very, when you look at it that way, it's a very weird world. And there is where I come out and say, if we can make alliances with immigrants in our countries, who come from so many different parts of the world, you know, they give us a kind of knowledge, a kind of understanding, kinds of insights, things that are happening in their countries. And then you begin to have a kind of a, a, a citizenship mode and practice that is truly shaped in a multi-sided global way. And I think that, to me, is the next agenda. Because the states, for one reason or another, uh, they are they are lost. I think the the I use this. I'm, I'm just giving a second lecture. I'm sorry. I'm just your question is I, I I'm so interested in this subject, but I'm I'm going to stop talking now. I don't know if there is another question, but um, otherwise, okay. Maybe this is the last one. I don't want to take away time from the next panel. 
Thanks for your speech, it was truly inspiring and I will probably buy your book, um, hopefully. Oh. <laughs> hopefully to also, um, I think I was just so consumed maybe in listening to your argument, arguments that right now that I'm, when I'm looking at this slide, I am wondering, so what does making citizenship mean when, in contrast to consuming citizenship? The last things you've said, I think hinted towards that, were the togetherness of people from different spaces and territories and places is able maybe to counter their globalized finance mechanism. But I really wonder what making citizenship would be in contrast to what we have. Look, c contesting the financial bit is a, is a complex issue and it should not be the guiding principle. The guiding principle is to understand where we fit in the world, and that includes at one end the miseries, the poverties, the lack of food, the being expelled from your land, and at this end it, can, it involves the environmental destruction. Look what happened just in Germany. Just to give you an example, it, you know, right now in this country, besides the foreclosures and all of that, all kinds of things. You know the story that the renewables, you made your renewables policy, which was then voted down by a special commission, for being too expensive. And who appears? Waterfall from nice country, Sweden, launches a lawsuit against your government. I assume you know all of this, right? For billions and billions of lost profits because Germany gave up nuclear. I mean, do you? And, and they have a legitimate claim under existing treaty law. We need to learn from each other. Right now in Colombia, there is an African gold mine that is extracting billions of water from one of the key sources, the sources of water, not just a lake in there, the sources in the mountains. This is in Tolima. I mean, we learn from each other. So leave finance to people like me who are really moving in there and trying to find an alternative language to map what finance is about. So I don't use the term finance, but just a capacity, a capability to destroy <laughs> and to make maybe. But, but what we can learn from each other, we who are being pushed and pushed, remember that there are, we're running out of terrain also. Huh? So we are going to see more and more refugees. We already know that you already know that too, right? There are vast numbers of people. There is no more land for them either because of what I described or because it's desertified or because there's no more water. I mean, we sooner than we know it, we're going to see that there is a whole humanity out there that we better work with them because we can learn from them rather than being afraid of them. That would be a mistake. But it's going very fast. You know that the scientists who work on the environment, that that's a good canary in the mine, as we used to say, Right. They are saying it's going much faster than we thought. It's a tipping point. What I showed you about the RLC, look how little time it took. The, the Midwest land in the United States, it still looks green, 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 the breadbasket of the world, as they like to call it, But because they use all these fertilizers, so it all looks pretty green. But the land in the last five years is hot, 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 hot. Hot land means it is dying. But it doesn't look that way. So did I say at the beginning that we should have maps that show dead land and dead water that we made? Right now, 440 dead water zones in coastal areas alone. So what I think, of when I th say we should work with immigrants, it's of course the rights issues and the abuses and imprisonment, but it is also learning. They, we learn from each other's particularities. I'm sure that you learn from each other. In these three days, there must be people from other countries, etc. It's something that we have lost. The Occupy movements, I thought, were very important in two regards, and that was their contribution. First, they learned how to make the social. We don't know anymore how to make the social. We know it when we enter certain say, urban agriculture, stuff like that, we suddenly rediscover, oh, God, yeah, we, we have to work together. I can't do it alone, you know. It's not just a firm that's going to take care of it. It's others like me, right? So um, so that is, I now, just now I lost my track of thought. I got involved in urban agriculture here for a minute. Okay, so we learned the, the, the Occupy movements, how to make the social. And the other thing is hanging out there together, how much they learned from each other. You know, other worlds, other vectors through which they wind up in that place. So my, my sense is 
And again, I wrote this book, you know, that in German was published by Fischer Verlag, 200 Years of Immigration. Uh, and I, I, asked, I used Europe as a natural experiment, you know, because it is so diff such a different internal migration. I was not interested in leaving the continent, inside the continent. And one thing that is quite extraordinary is how the racism against your cousin, you know, when you are, when the foreigner was your same phenotype, your same religious group, you didn't want. So when Haussmann built Paris, part of Paris, so the tanks could move in, so to say, um, he brings in, very aware of the Catholic question of workers, he brings in German Catholics and Belgian Catholics. Guess what? The French Catholic workers said, they are not good Catholics. They hated them. So that is just to me this master example. So anyhow, I'm saying this because I think the question of the other, the immigrant, etc. You know, we need to we need to learn from our own histories that now we think all oh, so different. I mean, there are extreme cases. The war in Iraq also fed m more extremism. Clearly, it seems to me clear. Um, uh, but at some point, they become the we. In the United States, the Germans, the Irish, they were seen as so different. At some point, they become the us. And then there is a whole new group that you can you know, demonize. And so uh, Europe has had a similar history. Anyhow, I, I do think that the immigrant vector, partly I mention it because it is also a learning space. We learn about the world. That learning about the world means constituting some kind of operational space, mobility of imaginaries and project space that begins to connect us. I think that is the way, for me it seems, the battle will align. So it's both the very local, thick encounters and then some sort of more larger global space. But the foreigner represents knowledge. Knowledge, very specific about something. Then you understand, my God, what's happening in this country? What is Waterfall doing, suing my government, taking away money because they can't make a profit, because they can't do the nuclear bit? You know, that's, a, to me, a very dramatic example. Or am I wrong? I know the facts, not on the facts, but I mean in thinking that this is a significant example. Do you think this is weird or not? <laughs> I think it is a perfect example, frankly. No, they don't. They don't think. They have no time to think. Right. But, you know, people slowly are beginning to think about certain issues, right? Because Anyhow, I really have to stop. I just would love to keep on chatting, but I know that I'm taking away time for the next panel. So thank you very much.